Hey, I'm Kiwi. It's been about a year since I graduated from college with a bachelor's in history, and I still cannot shut up about the past. I'm an avid podcast listener and a YouTube watcher, and after learning so much from the best history and social science content creators on the internet, I'm captivated by those people who are brave enough to share the stories that they've researched and learned about with everyone and connecting us all to our shared past. I'm a history nerd and I've always loved introducing people to new times and places and helping my friends think more deeply about the history that they already know. But I am not sure if I'm cut out for this whole internet content creator thing Honestly, it just seems like a lot of work and I am not used to putting my work out there for the entire world to see. So I am recording an old paper from my senior year of college and just putting it out there and see what happens. I'm not sure if this will become a series. Actually, it's very likely that I just upload this one podcast and that is it. But I hope at the very least the dozen or so of you who listen will learn something new. So without further ado, I present Ownership Under Slavery, How Enslaved African Americans Came to Own Property in the Antebellum South. I'll start with a quote from uh, Reverend Macy uh, from Petersburg, Virginia. He is a former slave who grew up as a kid under slavery um, and this was recorded in the 1940s. Uh, also a disclaimer, the, the text is written in vernacular instead of regular English. This was recorded by a white interviewer, Susie Bird, in the 1940s. I'm not trying to affect any sort of accent, only trying to stay true with the source material as it exists today. The first money I got was made by cutting pine poles and making this coal you burn wood into. After all the wood burn, you put out the fire with water and let the coal dry off and then sell it. Your master would lend you his old steer and a cart to take to town. And my pappy made extra tobacco for himself, sold it, and used the money to buy his extra garments. If they didn't have anything for you to do, you could do this work at nighttime, if you was a smart fellow. What's most intriguing about Reverend Macy's tale is not that he would remember the details of such mundane aspects of slave life. What stands out about the Reverend's experience is its basic premise, an enslaved person earning, possessing, and owning money. It's widely known that enslaved people had effectively no rights under the law during slavery and that enslaved people were legally the property of their white masters. In a textbook understanding of slavery, Reverend Macy's story might not make any sense, but history is always more complicated than what you read in law books and are taught in school. This is the story of how enslaved African Americans in the 1800s got property used their property to turn a profit and protected their property in court. Enslaved people invested in property in the hopes of securing their future and the future of their families. They observed and understood their legal relationships to their masters to better identify opportunities and threats ahead of time. However, enslaved people were still economically and legally disabled in the antebellum South. It was no easy task for people who theoretically could not sue in their own name, except for for their freedom, to take their property claims to court. Non-slaveholding white people and planters alike exploited the vulnerable legal position of enslaved African Americans for their own monetary gain, securing and profiting off of property ownership under slavery was an increasingly uphill battle for African Americans in the South. For my sources, I draw predominantly from secondary historical research, books written by other historians on specific topics, and I also draw on statutes or laws written at the time. 
I would also like to give a special shout out to the Federal Writers Project of the U.S. Works Progress Administration, the WPA. Um, as a part of FDR's New Deal, in the 1930s and 40s, the U.S. government hired and sent out a bunch of people to interview the last generation of former slaves throughout the South. These former slaves uh, were in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s by the time that they were interviewed by the Works Progress Administration. And that meant that almost all of them were under the age of 18 or really young when the Civil War ended and slavery ended in the United States. Much of these interviews are in fact digitized and on the internet. In fact, they are very easy to access. And so I highly, highly, highly recommend if you're at all interested, look up the Works Progress Administration Slave Project. They have different interviews from states all across the country. It's so enlightening and intriguing and interesting and horrifying in so many ways to just read the words of people who lived through slavery, who were slaves and were owned by other people. It's mind-blowingly fascinating. Okay, so before we keep going, let's talk about a little bit of the context because it is super interesting and there's so many things about the 1800s that get lost when we talk about US history or the history of slavery. So here's just a big rundown. At the start of the 1800s, the United States had just earned independence from Great Britain. One of the big rallying cries for the revolutionaries was a freedom from tyranny and individual rights. But as many of us know, they were increasingly investing in slavery while they were talking about these individual rights. While white northerners hoped that this peculiar institution called slavery would magically disappear over the course of the next century, white Southerners did the absolute most to ensure that slavery would expand and continue until the end of the world. They had no intention of letting slavery go anywhere. All the while that this debate was happening around slavery, white settlers were moving into Native American territory in the West to escape the increasingly crowded East Coast. They were searching for land and treasure. And when controversy inevitably arose, the federal government stepped in to resolve, hope you can hear the air quotes there, quote unquote, resolve the problem, which usually meant just outright killing or displacing Native Americans. By the Civil War, slavery was at its absolute height and showed no signs of slowing down. While the slave trade across the Atlantic had been shut down mostly in the early 1800s, eastern states in the U.S. began to breed enslaved human beings and sell them to the Southwest so that they could profit off of the large industrial plantations in states like Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. Another thing to keep in mind in this changing landscape is U.S. law in this period. The American colonies inherited the common law system from Great Britain. While statutes are important in common law, the big bulk, the lion's share of the law, is left uncodified. That means it is not written down word for word. Rather than keeping a detailed, regularly updated code, a list of every tiny little rule designed to address every conceivable circumstance that would arrive in court, common law systems rely on courts to use reason and logic to fill in the gaps between broadly written statutes. On top of this, one of the central features of common law is the buildup of precedent, a body of previously settled cases that courts use as a guide for settling future cases. So instead of a law for every individual possible situation, one court comes across a new situation, applies the law, and then when the next court comes across a similar situation, they just say what that court did. And it, that's how it generally works. After the American Revolution, the law in the United States was still rapidly changing, though. They were blending old sources of English common law with new revolutionary ideals of 
a localized participatory uh, democratic government. Contested legal conversations and new legal issues created a system where pretty much every local area had their own way of doing things. Contested legal debates and new legal issues created a highly localized system designed to secure the individual rights of property holding white men. So for example, every city, county, state, etc., kind of just made up their own laws as they went along, applied them as they saw fit using logic and reason. The broad principle, and this is a big generalization, but the broad principle is that it was pro the protection of property rights was the main goal of all of these laws. And specifically, obviously, the property rights of people who could hold property, which at the time were wealthier middle class and upper class white men. These white men were not only the only people legally recognized as full civic participators in the early republic, but they also had legal rights over quote unquote dependents. And these are people who by law did not have full political and legal rights, such as women, the impoverished, and African Americans, both free and enslaved. With little in the way of settled precedent and a wide latitude under common law to resolve disputes any way they deemed fit, courts of the antebellum South deployed a wide variety of legal tactics to protect and advance the property interests of white men, planters, and slaveholders in particular. So, the first question of enslaved property ownership is, how does one lay claim to property when they have no legal right to do so? Primarily, enslaved people laid claim to property through long-term association and possession. The more often someone saw an enslaved person with a certain object, cultivating a certain field, or raising specific livestock, the stronger the enslaved person's claim to that property became. To build this association, enslaved people frequently use public displays of possession. For instance, in Liberty County, Georgia, two enslaved people, Henry Harris and Samuel Osgood, would count their hogs, their pigs, when they fed them, and publicly brag over which one of them had the most hogs and which ones were the best. In testifying on behalf of Osgood to the Southern Claims Commission, more on them in a bit, Harris recalled details about the amount, age, and quality of the livestock taken by the Union Army from Osgood as they foraged the plantation. In describing the three cows the Union Army commandeered from Osgood, Harris testified, I know these cattle belong to the, to the claimant Osgood because he raised them. He had been raising cattle for 10 years and in all this time, no one else ever claimed them. Harris's description of Osgood's livestock shows how enslaved people sought to lay claim to property through public displays. We mentioned the Southern Claims Commission earlier. Um, a little bit more about them. The Southern Claims Commission was created following the Civil War to compensate any Southerners who supported the Union for the property it unjustly taken by the Union Army during the war. Enslaved people living on plantations frequently had their property seized by the Union Army, who assumed all the property on the plantation was owned by slaveholders, or didn't care whose property they were quote-unquote foraging, which meant they were taking um, and using without compensating anyone. This resulted in a great deal of former slaves petitioning the Southern Claims Commission for compensation by proving their ownership of seized property largely through testimony of other enslaved neighbors. So it's a this is a really interesting case of enslaved people having to prove that they own things during a time when they like legally didn't own anything. They legally could not own property because they were property. And so retroactively, they're trying to claim that they own things and they saw that they own things before the law even believed that enslaved people could own anything. So it's a very important set of primary sources to understand one, that enslaved people believe that they owned things, they possessed things, even though the law said they didn't. And two, 
that they could, because they were successful, they could get these uh, claims of property recognized in court. Another way to convey public ownership was utilizing the layout of the plantation. Planters often put slave quarters within eyeshot of their house or the house of the overseer to keep tabs on the activities of enslaved people. On the plantation, much of what enslaved people did was in plain view of others. This meant that property could easily be placed where everyone on the plantation would, at some point, or another, see it and associate it with the specific enslaved person who owned it. Many former slaves asserted that they knew where everyone's property was because they saw it every single day. One former enslaved woman from Jackson, Mississippi, Henrietta McLaughlin, recalled how she recognized other slaves' property. Quote, I lived only a door from Mrs. Lee and I knew what property she had. I didn't know everything she had in her trunks and boxes, but I knew what was in sight, such as provisions and bedding. For enslaved people in the South, being seen with their property was a major way to gain recognition of their property. And building on that, enslaved people also built association with their property by taking it and wearing it to church. People would often testify in detail about other enslaved people's property. Enslaved people would also make sure to only bring their best things to church, which also imbued the property with a personal and spiritual significance. One enslaved miller in Maryland, Charles Cox, wept as he dug through the ashes of a burned down mill, looking for pieces of his Sunday clothes that were lost. Another enslaved man who greeted the Union soldiers in Liberty County, Georgia, unsuccessfully pleaded with the foragers to allow him to keep the quote nice linen shirts i used to go to communion in as they picked his former owner's plantation clean being seen with one's property whether in the yard the slave quarters or at church was crucial to establishing ownership over that property Concessions by slave owners were also a major source of enslaved people's property rights. Many slave owners allotted land for enslaved people to tend in their spare time. In spare moments, mostly on Sunday, enslaved people would cultivate uh, sometimes sizable amounts of land on plantations for their own benefit. They not only grew food crops to feed themselves and their families, but enslaved laborers often grew crops to sell for profit. Some, like Reverend Macy's father, grew tobacco and other cash crops of the region. This, however, was not common because masters had total control over what their enslaved laborers would grow, and many worried that slaves would steal, quote-unquote steal, the plantation's crop and pass it off as their own, ignoring the fact that the owners were stealing the labor of the enslaved people. The land, while not legally, quote-unquote, owned by the enslaved laborers was more than just a patch of dirt for them to have a garden. Even when masters did not meticulously grant each enslaved family their own plot, enslaved people maintained ownership over the space they cultivated on the plantation. For example, on a Georgia plantation where a man named Charles Ball was enslaved, Patches would be divided up and fenced off with an assortment of different objects to denote, quote, the property of the various families. Enslaved families laid claims of ownership over their land and their space on the plantation. Ball's story not only tells us that people endeavored to signal property ownership, but others recognized the land claims of enslaved people. And the next one will hit home for a lot of the people out there who might be farmers or uh, were raised in uh, the rural America and rural America. Enslaved people also claimed, bought, and sold livestock. Hogs, in particular, were great sources of revenue for enslaved people. They were low maintenance and were worth a lot when fully grown. Enslaved people also owned cows. The problem with big livestock, though, like cows and hogs, was that they wandered around to find food. And this meant that enslaved people, like any livestock owner even to today, needed to lay claim 
to their livestock in their absence. First, this involved knowing everyone's animal's physical features in great detail. So you know your neighbor's cow has spots in a specific pattern or they have, you know, different uh, coats and stuff like that. Um, or, you know, what their pigs look like and they're generally in the same area, right? And second, this is really interesting, the owner of a cow or another large uh, livestock animal would often brand their property. Enslaved people also communicated their brands, the brands on their cattle, with their masters and kept track of the animal. Some enslaved people even paid local white people to do the marking for them and make sure that their neighbors would recognize the slave's ownership. This is, it's, it's really interesting because this meant that enslaved people were basically acting as full-time farmers and ranchers while working on a, on a slave plantation, really, because they were raising their own cattle and they were branding their own cattle. The masters recognized that they owned specific cattle. White people outside the plantation recognized that they owned specific cattle. In fact, the only entity, the only person who's not in on the fact that enslaved people were owning livestock seemed to be the government, which is wildly interesting. And the owning and branding of livestock is especially important because it demonstrates that slaves' property ownership was recognized by more than other enslaved people. Masters and neighboring white people acknowledged and respected enslaved people's property even in the absence of any legal protection. Enslaved people were not simply idly accumulating property. They understood how to turn their claims on property into wealth in the real world. Throughout the antebellum era, enslaved Southerners traded their small amounts of spare time for property, which they turned into profit. Some hoped to use this to purchase their freedom, while others relied on it to make life under slavery marginally more palatable. Either way, enslaved laborers found lucrative ways to take advantage of property ownership. One major example of enslaved people profiting off their property is slave ferries. Throughout the South, enslaved people invested in boats to navigate the rivers of America and commodified this freedom of movement for their own gain. In their free time, Enslaved Low County Georgians and Carolinians constructed boats and cultivated extensive knowledge of traversable waterways. These skilled enslaved workers ferried white people, black people, and even runaway slaves across the rivers of the South. One such African-American ferryman aided John Andrew Jackson in his 1846-47 escape from slavery. It was Christmas Day when John Andrew Jackson first set out from the plantation to escape from slavery. He calculated that Christmas time, people were going to be distracted from the holiday festivities and would not be paying close attention to the activities of the enslaved people on the plantation. On his way, escaping the plantation, uh, Jackson ran into a ferryman who was allowed by his master to keep all the money he was earned that day ferrying people across the Santee River in South Carolina. So this uh, ferryman was very pleased to get John Andrew Jackson's 20 cents that he had saved up for the escape. Here, this ferryman leveraged his Christmas holiday for financial gain, his free time. He capitalized on the time he was afforded and used it to make more money. So because he had Christmas Day off and because his master gave him the ability to make extra money on Christmas, keep all of his money, he was able to take some agency in his own life, a very little agency, to help maybe save up for his family or to earn a little bit of his keep. While Jackson's purchase of the enslaved ferryman's services was a small interaction in the grand scheme of his escape, it is a clear example of enslaved people leveraging their time to turn a profit. On his journey north, John Andrew Jackson encountered many more examples of enslaved laborers in the South leveraging their time for capital gain. 
When arriving in Charleston, South Carolina, looking for a ship to Boston, Jackson hid among enslaved African-American laborers whose master was out of town. In the city, it was common for enslavers to send their enslaved laborers out into the town to find work and provide for themselves. Jackson, for a short time, worked with a, quote, gang of Negroes working on the wharfs and received a dollar and a quarter per day. Of their pay, the enslaved laborers had to give $2.50 a week to their masters and would be whipped with a cat of nine tails if they failed to pay up at the end of the week, and the rest of what they earned they would keep. While 89 cents per day is not a kingly income, after accounting for food, clothing, and other expenses the masters did not provide, it meant a very limited degree of economic freedom in a system that was designed to afford these enslaved people as little freedom as possible. Under slavery, enslaved workers, both in cities and the countryside, took advantage of every opportunity to gain economic freedom. And keep this example in mind, because we're definitely coming back to this, because there are some strong parallels to the present day. Let's talk about some black markets, and not black markets in the, the trade of illicit goods, black markets in the sense that the fact that they were run by black people made them illegal. So they're quite literally black markets. Enslaved property holders also sold goods in the informal slave economy. In some places, black people practically cornered the market for certain goods, like chickens or baked foods. This success in the markets was driven by enslaved people's, especially enslaved women's, skills at marketing. Black women could fill the air with verbal advertisements for their products. They knew how to speak with different customers to make this a good sale and negotiate good prices. Enslaved people claimed the public space during the day and sold their goods to anyone who would listen. The things enslaved people brought to sell were usually small and cheap, but very useful. Both white and black people came to slave markets to buy goods. Enslaved people built on an economy through their skill and expertise. Enslaved people and enslaved producers were a crucial part of the greater Southern economy. People from all walks of life relied on enslaved workers to produce goods on their free time and provide services on their free time. Enslaved workers capitalized on this need to turn their property into profit. Enslaved African Americans in the antebellum South were well aware of their status as property under the law. They frequently used this understanding of the law to protect themselves and their interests. Solomon Northrop, a Louisianan bondsman in the 1840s, was nearly hung by his master who was in a fit of rage when the overseer, a guy named Chapin, stopped the execution saying that Northrop was mortgaged, the slave, the enslaved person was mortgaged property. Until his master owned him free and clear, Northrop could not be killed. Knowing this, and knowing the Louisiana laws barring slaves from testifying against white men, Northrop insisted on spending the night in the great house in sight of the overseer. Northrop knew if the master came up in the middle of the night to kill him, he would need a white witness. He, Northrop said, had he stabbed me in the heart in the presence of a hundred slaves, not one of them by the laws of Louisiana, could have given evidence against him. And a little bit of a sidebar here, but it is crazy. In the time of slavery, you could get a mortgage. If you were a white slave owner, you could get a mortgage on a human being, which is wild. And on top of that, the only reason that you would not get thrown in jail for actually murdering someone in a fit of rage, if that person was an enslaved person you owned, the only way someone could get you in trouble for murder was if you had a loan on that person. And even if you were charged, even if the master had killed Solomon, he would not have been charged for murder 
he at most could be held liable for breaking the terms of, a, of the loan agreement, destruction or damaging of property, or maybe if he had an insurance policy out on the, an enslaved person, maybe he could get charged with insurance fraud. Northrop's awareness of the law and his use of it to protect himself was not an outlier. Enslaved people understood the legal significance of their economic value. Enslaved Southerners did not limit their appeals to the law to cases of life or death. They deployed legal arguments and found ways into court to protect their property rights as well. Despite the fact that enslaved people had almost no legal right to be heard in court, many were anyway, and not just in freedom suits. Enslaved people used the language of property rights to catch white elites and juries in a bind. While maintaining slavery at all costs was the purpose of Southern law, the primary mechanism through which they protected slavery was through the language of property. As we've said many times in this episode, enslaved people were the property of their masters. Enslaved litigants capitalized on this contradiction in the law to protect their property rights in court. Many enslaved litigants found creative ways to circumvent the restrictions barring them from having their cases heard in a court of law. One could find a white person to bring the claim on their behalf, as was the case with um, a man named Daniel Smith, who stole a watch from coins from an enslaved man named Bill, um, and this was in the Natchez district. Um, this is in between on the border of Mississippi and Louisiana. It's a place where a lot of uh, court cases uh, from this time period and involving enslaved people come from. Here, in this case, uh, the white man named Joseph Hawk brought the theft claim to a justice of the peace on behalf of Daniel Smith, the slave. Five white witnesses also testified in court claiming the enslaved man owned the property in question. This gold watch episode demonstrates how enslaved people not only got other enslaved people to recognize their property claims, but also white people. With the aid of white sponsors, enslaved people could turn their informal, sometimes illegal, property claims into legally recognized rights under slavery. On occasion, enslaved people brought claims in their own name. One case was of an enslaved woman named Elizabeth, who sued a white woman for $62 that Elizabeth had lent her. After months of refusing to pay the loan, Elizabeth finally took the woman to court to support her case, the enslaved woman produced a promissory note signed by the debtor to promising a prompt repayment. This, the Natchez court uh, awarded Elizabeth the, the debt plus interest. Normally in a case involving an enslaved woman, uh, one would expect that the owner to be listed as a party to the case uh, would be that enslaved person's master. However, um, Elizabeth's owner, Domingo Loreno, was not a party to the suit. Elizabeth's story shows that not only that enslaved people found ways to sue in their own name, but they also did so in furtherance of economic interests. $62 was a large sum for someone to lose to a stubborn debtor. For enslaved people, that amount of money could easily make a huge difference. And the fact that Elizabeth was able to use the power of the state to force a debtor to pay the money plus interest shows how concerned the white people and legal elites were about bad debtors in a world powered by credit. Because at this time, the US economy entirely ran on the credit and the word of trustworthy people. And so it was a huge threat to the legal system if debtors could get away with not paying back loans. And it was also a big way that they kept lower income white people and free black people in uh, a lower class of society by keeping them in cycles of debt. I don't want to paint the picture that it was all sunshine and rainbows living as a slave in the South in the 1800s. It wasn't. And all of this was still illegal. The trade, of black people selling goods to anyone 
the idea that black people could own property in, or sue in their own name or in anyone's name, all of this was still against the law in all southern states. And in fact, in the 1840s, local agricultural groups bemoaned the inability for South Carolina or local governments to limit enslaved economic activities despite the fact that it was against the law. Indeed, in South Carolina, it had been against the law since 1796 for any shopkeeper. It was against the law in South Carolina for any shopkeeper, trader, or other person to directly or indirectly buy or purchase from any slave in any part of the state essentially any goods unless the buyer had permission from the slave's master. Even though the prohibition on trading with slaves had been codified in South Carolina for decades, groups like the Savannah River Anti-Slave Traffic Association, who fought to limit enslaved people's economic activities, faced an uphill battle in convincing anyone to enforce the law. In an 1849 meeting, the Anti-Slave Trafficking Association uh, commented on how enslaved African Americans openly violated the law and traded with white people, despite their agitating and claims that the black economic activity would lead to greater crimes, the Anti-Slave Trafficking Association lacked the support from white people. The failure of uh, the Anti-Slave Traffic Association to garner support for enforcing existing regulations on enslaved African Americans in a white supremacist slaveocracy built around the constant surveillance and exploitation of black people raises a very important question. Why did slaveholding elites not side with regulators in restricting the movement of enslaved human property? If enslaved people were accumulating property, having their claims uh, to property recognized by other whites, slaves, and even courts of law in some cases, and using their property to accumulate wealth to buy themselves out of slavery, did the enslaved economy not pose a threat to white supremacy and the power of white people? No, it did not. While enslaved people worked hard to benefit from the legal quirks that enabled the informal slave economy, enslavers were undoubtedly the main beneficiaries of the system. Enslavers increasingly incorporated the informal economy into the formal system of slavery over the course of the 19th century. While many non-slaveholding whites were openly critical, as we earlier saw, of the informal slave economy, mostly because they had to compete with slaves over market share for uh, local crops and like small product crops. Planters were generally comfortable with the informal economy because it reduced their subsistence costs and increased profit. Instead of enforcing laws restricting enslaved people's trade, enslavers realized that they could leverage the informal slave economy to cut down on their operation costs while still keeping slaves in bondage. Bonds people became increasingly integrated into their local economies. And one of the things that is really interesting, going back to John Andrew Jackson and the people in Charleston, South Carolina, the enslaved people who would have to pay their master um, a bit of their uh, earnings every single day, it was actually an, a really good business opportunity from the perspective of slave owners in the South, because kind of like if, you know, a little bit of a pop culture reference or recent history, um, recently there was a lot of stir about self-driving Teslas uh, being able, you could buy a Tesla that could drive itself and while you're at work, it can drive around and be an Uber, basically, be a taxi for people around the neighborhood or around where you work, and it will come back and pick you up and you can be earning this passive income. This is the same idea, or just any white people with a little bit of capital could buy a human being to go out and do work for some employer or some project in the city. And that employer very often would just pay the white man, the white person who owned the slave directly. Or if they, and these enslaved people oftentimes work shoulder to shoulder with free black people 
and white people, who were all obviously free at the time. It's a very interesting system where, as a slave owner, you can use slavery to generate yourself this passive income. You don't even really ever have to meet this human being that you own, or these human beings that you own. All you have to do is sit and watch people come in and hand you money, and then that's it. You get to go about your life. It's an incredible economic investment, an incredible way to build wealth um, and have multiple streams of income. And that's a thing that we focus on so much today is multiple streams of income, diverse, overemployment. It's a very common thing in the modern world. And it is, on one hand, so interesting that this has been a thing for well over a couple centuries, two centuries, this fixation on passive income. And it's deeply disturbing that this thing that we do today was an integral part of slavery and that people were using other human beings bodies to generate passive income essentially passively stealing enslaved people's labor you don't even have to ever see this enslaved person to earn their income from them. It's a mind blowing thing. And it really turns like our kind of, our understanding of slavery on its head in a way that is really hard to grasp until you learn this historical context. But yeah, in the antebellum American South, enslaved people not only owned property, but they deployed the letter of the law and the force of the state to protect it. They invested in property in the hopes of securing their future and the future of their families and observed and understood their legal relationships to their masters to better identify opportunities and threats ahead of time. However, enslaved people were still economically and legally disabled in the antebellum South. Non-slaveholding white people and planters alike exploited the vulnerable legal position of enslaved African Americans for their own monetary gain. Securing and profiting off of the ownership under slavery was increasingly an uphill battle for African Americans in the South. In many ways, Reverend Macy and his father were engaged in a radical resistance to the system of slavery. They asserted their property rights in a world in which they were property. However, they were merely acting as intended by the slave-holding white powers that were. Thank you so much for listening to uh, this short, not really short. Thank you so much for listening to this uh, podcast episode. Like I said, this could be a one and done, probably will be. Um, but I hope, sincerely hope that you learned anything. If you have any historical or uh, editorial feedback, please let me know. Sound off in the comments if this was helpful in any way. Um, put that down there. That would be amazing to hear that you know, my work is, did not go out into an empty void. Um, but that's all I have for today. Um, have a good day and hope that you'll hear from me soon.